Okay, welcome and thank you for coming to the VCE Loudoun Spring Series of Online Classes. This is Denise Palmer's second in her series of vegetables. She's a master gardener from the class of 2005. And she's our vegetable queen. I'm Barbara Bailey. I'm the VCE Community Engagement Coordinator. It is a huge mouthful. Uh, in charge of the Master Gardener. So I will introduce Denise and have her take it from here and you're in for a big treat. Let me go through some of the screens here. If you've never been on a Zoom, we are utilizing chat to ask questions. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little box that says chat. So click on that and you can type in your question and we'll ask the questions at the end of the session. So thank you and enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me, um, I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint. Uh, do you, Barb, what do you see on your screen right now? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Share your screen. So I minimize the PowerPoint. Yeah, go into the bottom where it says share screen. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and then you can pick it from there. There you go. There we go. There we go, now I got it. Excellent. Um, so good afternoon. So this afternoon what we're gonna do is we're gonna touch on the spring vegetables. Um, it is uh, mid-April, so it's a good time to get in some of those spring vegetables and, uh, and know what some of their particular care requirements may be um, when uh, thinking or choosing spring vegetables. Uh, I'll, some of my information, actually, probably a lot of my information is going to be um, geared to the new or the beginner gardener. Um, and so for those of you who are more experienced or have the knowledge, I ask you to bear with me as I present um, information that sort of encompasses some of the basic principles of uh, gardening as well, vegetable gardening as well. Um, last week I spoke about uh, soil and how to amend your soil and we also talked a little bit about planning. Planning is key when you're when you're talking about a vegetable garden, especially if you're going to grow something other than just tomatoes. Um, something else I want to touch on is we have all this choice in the stores uh, with the seeds and you know I see people at the seed rack and and you know they if they're new, I can always kind of tell if they're kind of new at it because uh, they're just, you know, they're looking and they're not quite sure wh what they should pick and why they should pick it and do they have enough space um, because the seed racks at the uh, home improvement stores or wherever you find them, they can be sort of daunting. Um, everything looks, the pictures look so uh, great. So, I mean, they look wonderful and you thought, well, I can do that and I can do this and I can do that. And then, you know, you get it all home and you got to start planning, well, how are you going to do this and that? And so when we're, this, the, this slide goes to more of the planning aspect. Um, when we're growing vegetables, we really want to focus, especially if we are small space gardeners. If we're suburban gardeners, we don't have a lot of space. Um, some of us just don't have a lot of space. We may have more space we can make into a garden, but we don't have a lot of time to do it. Um, so our best economic value if we're growing um, vegetables is sort of the, the vegetables which are easier to do. Um, and you can see I've listed out some things there, um, beans and beets, uh, broccoli, uh, I don't know why that's in there, because broccoli here can be kind of a hard vegetable to grow, especially to get it past the pest stage. Um, but cucumbers certainly are easy, and leaf lettuce, I think, is about the easiest next to radishes. Um, peppers and summer squash and Swiss chard and tomatoes, um, they offer the best economic value when we're growing our vegetables. Uh, you know, onions and potatoes, they're all great vegetables if you have the space. But again, if your space is limited, those vegetables can have a tendency to take up a lot of garden space. Now, potatoes, 
in particular, I grow in containers because I don't have a lot of space myself. And I find that container grown uh, potatoes are, uh, they're a great way to experiment with them and grow some. But obviously you're not going to get a whole lot of production out of them. Uh, usually I get three to four meals out of them for just the two of us, for my husband and I. So if, you're, if space is sort of something which you need to think about, um, then I would hold the onions and the potatoes out of the garden and, and uh, plan to purchase those at the grocery store unless um, they become, un unless you become unable to purchase those at the grocery store in the future. Uh, vegetables which are better homegrown, but, but growing them may result in smaller yields because they have special care requirements. Um, artichokes are one of those. Artichokes are meant uh, here, you have to choose an artichoke transplant. They would go in as a transplant, not as a seed. And you'd have to choose one that will actually yield in the first year. Uh, consider that 80% of the artichokes grown in the United States are actually grown in California. So artichokes aren't necessarily uh, made to grow in our climate, um, but certainly you can, you can do it. Just make sure you're choosing a transplant uh, which would have uh, production on the first year. Cauliflower, cauliflower doesn't like temperatures or doesn't grow well in temperatures that are really above 70 or 75 degrees. Well, consider that, you know, we're going into, we're going to spring and then we'll go into summer. Um, cauliflower has a higher likelihood of bolting when we plant it in the spring than if we were to plant it as a fall crop. So cauliflower is one of those vegetables. Um, if, if we get a heat streak here during the spring or even the early summer, um, you're probably not gonna get um, any production out of it. Celery is another one of those. It really doesn't like the heat. Certainly you can give it a shot and, and try it out, but understand that it is a, a vegetable which takes four months um, to mature. And if it is hot, it's going to slow down. Um, it may get stringy. You'll have to blanch it. Again, just one of those vegetables that takes some, a lot of care. Now I have eggplant in here and a lot of people say, well, why do you have eggplant in there? I mean, eggplant's fairly easy to grow. Yeah, it's fairly easy to get started, but once those flea beetles hit it, um, you'd be struggling. And about the end of May, you put your eggplant um, in your garden, and I grow mine in containers, and about the end of May, you start to see the um, flea beetles um, start to come out, and they will just eat it alive. Um, I manage to grow eggplant fairly successfully, but the way I do that is by uh, making sure that I'm growing in a container, and I'm growing it um, three foot off the ground. Um, I have less pressure. But again, unless you know that, um, and you just go ahead and put it in a garden situation, uh, you may see that the flea beetles decimate it before it can actually do anything to produce. Uh, head lettuce takes a long time, needs a lot of water, and really likes the cooler weather. And then carrots. Carrots are easy, relatively easy to grow. The problem is with our soil here. If you have rocky or hard compacted soil, you're not gonna get the long carrots you find in the grocery stores. Instead, what you're gonna get is a misshapen carrot. Uh, maybe it's split, maybe it didn't do anything because our soil was too hard or we had too many pebbles or rocks in our soil. So if you're growing carrots, I think if you have the right kind of soil, carrots are actually pretty easy to grow. Um, just make sure that your soil is not compacted and that you don't have a lot of um, gravel or pebble or rocks in your soil. Um, if you are limited for space, uh, choose to grow those vegetables which are more expensive in the grocery store. And broccoli would be one of those. I mean, I love broccoli. Um, it's fairly expensive to buy in the grocery store because of the amount I eat. And so I would choose to grow broccoli in my, in my garden. Um, and then herbs, never forget your herbs because herbs can be quite expensive. I mean, they charge uh, kind of a, a lot of money to get, you know, a little bit of herb. Um, and herbs, you know, they grow, many herbs grow well in our gardens. Um, if you don't have space, then consider growing them in pots or containers. 
uh, so that they're not in your garden, but they're around your garden. And herbs are also great companion plants. I mean, herbs, when they start flowering off, um, they just really do a good job of drawing in our beneficial insects. I also touched last week on vegetable family uh, rotation. And I want to touch upon that again, because while we're in the sort of planning stage and we're going to get these things out in our garden, we want to really consider rotating our vegetables if this isn't just our first year. Um, we rotate our vegetable families because we don't want pests and disease to build up on our soil. If you're growing the same vegetables in the same place year after year, what's going to happen is our pests and diseases are going to build up in our soil. And so the pests will attack earlier, the diseases may strike earlier, and you may find yourself in a situation where your vegetables are going down earlier. Um, so try to rotate as much as possible in our small space gardens. It can be rather difficult um, to build up a rotation scheme, but it certainly it can be done. Uh, when we go through our vegetable family rotations, uh, you'll notice I have nightshades. So nightshade, the nightshade family encompasses all of these things, the tomatoes, the peppers, the Irish potato and the eggplant. So when we're talking rotation, um, we would want to rotate out this whole family of vegetables to another space in our garden in the next year. And the same with our cucurbits or, our, or the gourd family. Uh, we, we don't want to grow them in the same space. Our brassicas um, all encompass cabbage, broccoli, kales, turnips, collards. So all of those sort of cool season vegetables are, can be all mixed in um, with this brassica family. Uh, peas are legumes. Now, if you're not familiar with a legume and its properties, uh, so a legume, like if you were planting, if you planted snap peas, if you planted snow peas, if you planted, uh, let's say, green beans or snap beans, um, it's under the family of legumes. And what a legume does is it uh, fixes nitrogen from the air into your soil. So once you're finished with one of these crops and you pull up one of the roots, you should notice little nodules on your roots. And those nodules are actually the nitrogen which has been fixed from the air. Um, in our legume family, once you're done with that crop, let's say in the, in the instance of our peas, uh, we wouldn't pull out the roots. Instead, what we do is we cut that uh, plant uh, above at the soil line. So, because we want to leave the nitrogen in the soil so that the next crop can take advantage of the nitrogen. And the same thing with our snap beans, you know, in the late, uh, late summer, when snap beans are probably done, um, we would do the same thing. We would cut off at soil level the plant rather than pulling out the roots of that plant. Uh, the carrot family includes parsley uh, and parsnip. So you'll notice that they have sort of a finer foliage and they have uh, smaller uh, flowers. If something does flower in it, um, there's a small, smaller flower on it, and that smaller flower is, is very um, attractive to our beneficial insects. Uh, we have the onion family, and then the goosefoot family, which includes that beet. Uh, I know many of you are beet fans. I'm not so much a beet fan. Beets are kind of not on my short list, but a lot of people like them. Um, I like the Swiss chard. I, I'm a fan of the Swiss chard because it is a three season vegetable. And then we have the sunflower family. With the sunflower family or the family that contains lettuce um, or even the goosefoot family, our rotation scheme doesn't have to be so exact. Um, normally we say to rotate every third year. So we should be on a three year rotation. So the same family of vegetables should not be grown in that spot um, for three years. And then a lot of us though, don't have that kind of space. And so we may have to make our years between when the same vegetable goes in that spot, we may have to make it a little shorter, um, say every two or three years. Um, your goosefoot family and your lettuce family, um, they're not so hard on the soil and they don't have so many um, pests and insects 
that might complicate issues. Normally we don't have pests or insects with those types of things. So it'd be safer probably to plant them um, on a looser uh, rotation scheme. So when we're also talking about vegetables, you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of terms that are thrown out there. Uh, if you've gone to the farmer's market in the past, uh, you know that most people are gaga over the heirloom tomatoes. Oh, it's an heirloom tomato. And um, I love heirloom tomatoes. I think they have some really brilliant uh, characteristics. Um, I think they taste a lot better than, than a hybrid tomato. But let's be clear that an heirloom tomato, uh, for example, uh, doesn't have lo a lot of the resistance, maybe a hybrid tomato. So an heirloom, as you can see, I've got the description up there. It's, it's a very old variety. Now I will say that the, there are some out there that think an heirloom should be before 1926. Um, I've put 1950 in there because I guess I'm of that generation, but there is an older generation that doesn't consider an heirloom uh, um, except before 1926. Uh, but uh, it's a seed that has usually been handed down from families. Um, it's been saved. Uh, it's usually a regional seed, um, meaning that you've taken your strongest plant, you've saved the seeds from it, you've put it in your garden next, uh, the next year, and maybe it's grown to have some disease or pest resistance. Maybe it's, it's grown because it knows your weather pattern. So it does better in your weather, which, was, it's, which is hot and humid here. Um, it might have other characteristics, which is taken on because it's survived for so long. But an heirloom seed is one of those seeds which you can save and you can plant here and you should get a, a good crop, a good tasting crop from that. Now, when we talk about our hybrid seeds, I definitely believe that hybrid seeds have a place in our gardens. And that's because um, hybrid seeds, they've, they've been bred, we'll say, um, the same plants. Let's say we've taken two uh, different lettuce plants and we've bred them together um, because they had a desirable trait. Maybe they didn't get uh, the mildew on the leaves because it was too wet out. Uh, maybe they do better in heat. Uh, maybe they are, slugs don't like them so much. If you've ever grown lettuce, you know that if it's a wet, humid, sort of windless um, season, that we can have all of those things go wrong in lettuce. But hybrids, uh, you know, usually they have a characteristic which makes them desirable and lets them go further in your garden. Now with hybrids, one thing we do have to keep in mind, it means it only provides resistance or tolerance. It doesn't mean it's gonna be the end all. But especially in an organic garden, I think it's important where we're, we're more conscious of using less pesticides or no pesticides. Um, hybrids definitely have a, uh, a place in it, especially in an organic garden, because they shouldn't need as much care um, that maybe an heirloom may need, or if you can see the one below it, the open pollinated. Now the open pollinated just isn't old enough to have an heirloom. Um, it could be a new uh, variety that's been developed um, that uh, somebody said, oh, this is gonna be a really great vegetable. I'm gonna save the seeds from it. And I'm gonna you know, keep uh, calling out just the best from year to year, and then perhaps one day it becomes a uh, it becomes a uh, heirloom. Now, going back to the hybrid, I also want to say, with a hybrid, you can't um, save your seeds. Uh, you can save them. Well, I'll take that back. You can save them, but what you're going to get next year when you plant may not be the uh, the exact thing that you thought you were going to get when you planted it the first year. So with our hybrid plants, just remember we cannot save seeds. It's not going to usually come true in the second year. It's going to revert back to one of the parent's characteristics. With our heirloom and our open pollinated, um, we can save those seeds. And what we're looking for always when we're saving seeds is to isolate the strongest, best plant that's showing the characteristics 
um, that you like about it, and then um, saving those seeds. Uh, just a note on GMOs or genetically modified organisms. Uh, a lot of the seed catalogs I notice have, uh, we do not sell GMOs, blah, 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 blah. Okay, just to be clear that there are no GMOs currently for sale for the home gardener. Um, you cannot get your hands on them. So nobody sells them. Uh, in the future, you know, I have no idea whether that may be the case or not, but for right now, the home gardener um, cannot get their hands on GMOs for their home gardens. So let's concentrate on our cool season or spring vegetables. Uh, when I'm out and I've been lecturing in years past um, and I get uh, the questions and maybe I'm doing a, a summer series, um, it's really important to know when and for how long you, the period is for planting some of these spring vegetables. Certainly someone uh, coming to me in June and saying, you know, um, I just got my garden together and I, I really like peas. Uh, should, can I plant peas? Uh, my answer is always going to be, nope, you're too late. <laughs> the peas in about three weeks are gonna start burning up um, because of the heat, because they just don't like heat. So our cool season or spring vegetables, what I've done is I've arranged these by pretty much loosely around planting dates um, and you can see we're in April and a lot of these, it's prime time to get these um, spring vegetables into the ground. Now, uh, I've taken into account, yeah, as you go down the list, you can see I've, I've got, uh, you know, mid-March, we'll take the peas, for example, mid-March through early April. Um, and that's generally because, yeah, you can continue to plant peas up until, you know, in May, your soil may still be cool enough, but understand when it comes to production, when you want to get your harvest, uh, the heat in late June is, is just going to wilt the plants and it's going to burn them up. So with peas, we really early April is the latest we want to put them in, um, knowing that we're not going to get any uh, good harvest out of them because of the heat when they finally are harvestable in the June time frame. Um, also for this particular uh, slide, I've put in generally things that pertain to Leesburg. Now, if you're in an area that's um, warmer, uh, you may be able to adjust my sort of uh, time frame here, depending upon your situation. If you're in a cooler climate, you may have to wait. Um, and then, of course, in, within our own yards, we have microclimates. So I know that my garden box out in the back of my uh, yard is cold and it doesn't warm up and it's really the last place to warm up in my yard and that's because I have fences which surround my yard and it's in sort of a little dip and so this garden box um, stays pretty cold and so I have to uh, monitor when it might be right um, and when the soil might be warm enough in order for me to plant some seeds. If I were to plant seeds too early some of my seeds would just lay there and rot and of course, we seem to get rain now every three days, um, so it'd make it even worse. So you can see I've got your peas, and I did the peas um, first. Onions, most people will set them out as sets. They'll get onion sets, or they'll get transplants. And onions like the cool. They like to be planted in the cool, and they're pretty good about it. Now, if you're planting from seed, uh, onion seed really needs to be started as transplants and then set out into the garden. Uh, radishes, boy, you know, radishes, they will mature in 30 days, sometimes less. Um, if you're looking to get your children involved in uh, spring vegetable gardening, uh, just get yourself a pack of radishes and let the, let the little ones go at it. Um, they can be planted very early. They're very cold tolerant. Um, here we can start planting them in early March, um, but we really don't want to go past late April. And that's because radishes, again, when the heat starts to set in and the warmer temperatures start to set in, radishes really become woody. Uh, the taste is no longer sweet or that sort of tangy taste. Um, instead, what happens is, is they will get woody tasting and the insects will be drawn to them as well. There's a lot of bad insects <laughs> that actually like a radish top. 
And that's not, that's pretty, that's kind of good in a way, because if you don't intend to eat your radishes, you can kind of use your radishes as a companion plant for a little time in the garden. Uh, spinach, uh, a lot of people have a, a problems getting their spinach uh, germinated. Spinach is kind of a problematic germinator. Uh, a lot of people have problems and they, I myself sometimes will plant a couple of times just to get the spinach to come up. Uh, it's better, spinach I think is better um, planted in a block, in a block planting rather than a row. And by block planting, I mean just um, scattering the seeds on the top of the soil in a block and then um, putting a little uh, uh, soil over them so they have enough soil to germinate and then keeping them just relatively moist. You may have a better chance of getting spinach to germinate that well. Now spinach also has some heat tolerant types. There are more and more on the market we're seeing heat resistant types of spinach. Um, and so if you find seed packets, which, which you know, say that it's a heat, uh, heat resistant variety, um, I would say that you could plant them out till May 15th, but I also say in your garden, make sure you're planting the spinach. If we're sort of going into that summertime with the spinach, plant it in an area where it's gonna be shaded by something else. Maybe a tall tomato, uh, maybe you, if you have a larger garden and you're growing corn, um, plant it in an area where it's going to be shaded. And then Malabar spinach, I frequently get asked about Malabar spinach. Malabar spinach is a wonderful vine. If it's 100 degrees, it loves it. It climbs, it twists. It's a beautiful plant. Um, and we plant it after May 15th. Um, it is not frost tolerant and it needs to be planted after May 15th. And it's also not a true spinach. Um, hence why it can do so well in the hot weather. But a lot of people use it as a hot weather spinach. Um, they like the taste of it. I am not a fan of the Malabar. I think its taste is just a little bit slimy. Um, and for that reason, I, I just grow it for its ornamental value. Now kale here is a three season crop, meaning you can plant kale in late March and it will grow up and you can be harvesting it at the end of spring, you can be harvesting it in summertime, and you can be harvesting it in fall time. So kale is one of those crops that just doesn't peter out in that particular season. It will continue to produce um, until really it gets down into the 20s um, in December, uh, if that's when our 20s occur. Now I will have to say during uh, August, late July, August, kale can become a pest magnet and it can become a bad pest magnet and you'll have to take action to um, cover it uh, and protect it if you want to go into the fall with it. And generally we would do that with row cover. Lettuce, uh, we have our planting dates. And again, we get um, heat resistant types there in lettuce. Uh, look at your package, uh, see if they are heat resistant. Um, again, one of, those, one of those vegetables, try to plant it in the shadow of something else because as it gets warmer and warmer, it will really do better and it will produce longer if it has some shade um, during those really hot days. Now potatoes, of course, you have to, they go in the ground as a seed potato or they go in your potting soil. They've got all kinds of containers out there for potatoes. There's lots of different methods to do potatoes. You know, the old fashioned way that I knew and grew up with was, you know, trench planting. But a lot of different people have done a lot of different things in growing potatoes these days. But you will have to make sure you get your seed potatoes. Now, I know there's all kinds of publications out there that say, hey, just go to the grocery store and get your seed potatoes. But I want to make you aware that um, if you get those potatoes from the grocery store and you start cutting them up and letting the eyes grow, that's all great. But understand that those are not certified disease-free potatoes. And if they're carrying a, a disease or a virus in those uh, potatoes that you got from the grocery store and you're planting it in your soil, you could potentially contaminate your soil where your soil would need to be remediated. Um, potatoes can have some pretty 
pretty virulent uh, issues with them. So I say to always be on the safe side, make sure you get your seed potatoes from a certified disease-free uh, source. Most of the times those are coming from an online source, although I know some of the big box stores also carry seed potatoes. Um, and if they're coming from the generally accepted uh, brand names, I would think that they would be um, okay to plant as well. Carrots. Uh, carrots can be an extremely difficult germination nightmare as well. And, that, and why? Because their seeds are so small. You know, you get those itty bitty seeds, you think it's one seed and it's like a hundred seeds. And you're like out of seeds before you know it because the seeds are so small. So with carrots, Another problem with carrots is they need to be, the soil bed needs to be kept moist at all times. And if our soil bed has a crust on it, you know, if, if you're an experienced gardener, you know you plant a seed and you water it in and during the uh, springtime and you go back and there may be a, a crust on that soil. And a lot of the other uh, vegetables can sort of break through that crust Carrots have a hard time getting through that crust, and that's what makes them sort of a difficult germinator. So with the carrots, if you're planting carrots, understand you will have to thin them. Otherwise, you're not going to get good carrots because they, they don't have any room to spread. Uh, with the carrots, make sure to keep the soil moist. Um, and again, make sure that your soil is not compacted with lots of rocks. If your soil is a little bit compacted, I would recommend buying the blunt tip carrots. Uh, the carrots that aren't, don't go 12 inches. Instead, they go wide rather than long. For our cabbage transplants, uh, cabbage, we can go into the garden. Now we're going these as transplants, not seeds. Uh, we simply don't have enough time in our, in our spring garden to go from a, ca to a cabbage seed to um, harvest. So we're putting our cabbage in as transplants and we're doing this in late March through late April. There are all kinds of cabbages you can get with all kinds of maturity dates. So if we're planting a late April uh, cabbage planting, uh, beware of what the harvest date is. If you're getting a long maturing cabbage, uh, we really don't want our cabbages maturing during the heat of July. We want to try to get those cabbages matured um, into early June, maybe mid-June if the weather is staying stable. But if we're at late April here, uh, look at your maturity dates and make sure we're getting those cabbages mature uh, before we get into the hot months, especially July. Uh, broccoli transplants, sort of the same situation. Broccoli, uh, we want to keep until mid-April before we put it in. I know a lot of people put it in a little earlier because they say that, oh, it's a cool weather thing. The problem with broccoli is broccoli, if it's below 50 degrees, constantly for a period of time, broccoli is going to what they call button up. It's not going to produce that head. Same thing with heat on broccoli. If it gets too hot and it stays hot and it stays hot for a number of days, it's going to do the same thing. Broccoli is going to button up. Uh, it's not going to produce that central head. You may get a little bit, but you know, it can be, broccoli can be a, a problematic a vegetable. And that's why we say to not put your transplants in until mid to late April because our weather is a little bit better then and stays a little bit warmer. And then once the heat, the heat is on, come in end of J June, July, or actually heat can come on for long periods of time before then, but that's typically when we see that heat then those broccoli um, heads will usually start to bolt and so you'll no longer be able to use it. So you want to get it in now um, in order to have any production out of that broccoli um, before the heat comes in. Now broccoli transplants again is one of those crops that could be planted in the shade of a, a summer vegetable so that that uh, shade is getting on the broccoli during um, the late spring and early summer. So maybe you can get your broccoli to go a little bit longer. And then Swiss chard. Uh, I'm a chard fan. Uh, it wasn't a vegetable I knew about until I came to uh, Virginia and these master gardeners turned me on to it. 
And now I like it because, and I like it because it's a three season crop. Unlike lettuce, which I can't get to go three seasons because of our heat, Swiss chard is one of those crops that can go three seasons. So we're planting it now. We, at the late spring, we'll start to harvest. In summer, we can start to har we harvest. And in the fall time, we'll harvest our Swiss chard. So we get those seeds in uh, about now is a good time. Uh, we can start putting them in. Swiss chard seeds do like a little more uh, warm soil than say our potatoes or our radishes. Um, Swiss chard seeds do take a long term time to, uh, to uh, germinate. So don't give up on the Swiss chard if, if you don't see them after seven days. Uh, they're probably uh, thinking about germinating. Uh, they're much along the same lines as beets. If you've ever planted a beet and you have like, when is this thing coming up? Uh, beets uh, can take a long time to germinate as well. And it has to do with uh, soil moisture and soil warmth. So we sort of covered the, the main uh, sort of spring vegetables. I'm sure there's some other spring vegetables out there. Uh, and if you have questions about them, feel free to ask me a question about them at the end. So when we're talking about, even though I have the slide summer companion planting, uh, a good thing to think about in our vegetable garden in the springtime is actually planting our companion plants. Now, we're still a little early for some of these companion plants. Um, dill, probably we want to wait until the 1st of May. Cilantro can actually go in now. Chives can go in now. Uh, sweet alyssum uh, is perfectly fine now. But our basils, we're definitely waiting on those basils because everybody knows who's an experienced gardener that as soon as it goes below 50 degrees, those basil leaves will turn black and basil will wilt and you'll be needing to replace that basil. Uh, borage seeds uh, can go into the garden now. Again, we'll want to want to wait on the French marigolds and the zinnias. Uh, calendula uh, can actually go into your garden now. It's a great native uh, plant, has a nice little flower on it, um, a lot of beneficials and a lot of bad pests um, like calendula. So it can either be a good in that it attracts beneficials or it can be a good plant in that it attracts bad pests. And once it's infested, what you're actually doing is pulling that plant out and getting it out of your garden. Uh, parsley uh, can be planted now. And then buckwheat, which is actually a cover crop, uh, cannot be planted until after last frost, which typically around here we say is May 10th. Buckwheat, you would need to look uh, online for cover crop. Uh, I'm not familiar that any of the stores locally actually carry it. I think it's something you need to um, buy online, but it's a wonderful cover crop for your summer garden when you, you have spaces in your garden and you don't want them to go to weeds. Uh, sprinkle some buckwheat in there like fairy dust and let it pop up and draw in your beneficial insects. And then I know we, we covered soil. Uh, so this slide is really for those of you who, who did not join us last week. Just some basic principles. I don't want to um, deep dive into this too much. Uh, you know, make sure we're testing our soil pH, um, that we're amending our garden soil yearly. Um, and then if you're starting a new garden, uh, sort of some instructions there for, you know, how to, how to make what soil, what kind of soil should go into your new garden. Always a mixture of topsoil and compost. Uh, it should be a mixture of both. And then you may need to add dry organic fertilizer on top of that um, if you're starting a new garden. Also in our regular, uh, for those who have our experienced gardeners, if you're not adding enough uh, amendments, either in the way of compost or aged manure or other amendments, you may need to add um, dry fertilizers to your vegetable garden as well. Uh, vegetables, they do their thing quick and they need uh, a, good, a good amount of nutrients in order to do it. So dry fertilizer is probably called for in most instances unless you are a super uh, experienced uh, vegetable gardener and have all kinds of amendments in your soil. 
And then once again, just to touch on, we're preparing for critters. That would be for uh, uh, people that are joining us this year or this time. Uh, we're preparing for our critters. Don't forget to do that because your little heart's going to get broken. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Uh, so just some some basic uh, requirements. You know, deer. You know, deer can get through most things. I have found though. I live in suburbia. I have a small backyard. It's all enclosed by other neighbors' fences, and I have found that um, fishing line on the open areas to the side of my house, fishing line at three and five foot uh, between two garden poles actually keeps the deer out of my backyard because they just move on down the road to the neighbor's yard. Um, in smaller areas, deer may be afraid to actually jump into the garden. So if you have a smaller area, uh, you may not need to do too much or have a seven and a half foot fence to exclude deer. Now, for those of you next to, you know, forest edges or with large acreages, um, you're going to need the big guns uh, to keep out the deer there. Groundhogs, huge problem for me. Uh, I have uh, fought with them almost every year. I've had a garden here. Uh, they come out to greet me each uh, springtime and I chase them off with my broom. Um, but they do, they will climb on my fence. I have a four foot fence, hardwire cloth fence around my yard and they will climb on it and they will jump into my garden. So what I have to do is I have to make sure that my fence is angled out so that they can't climb, when they're climbing up that fence, they're like, oh, and they're swaying back and forth and they don't think they can clear that top of it. So they'll climb back down. Rabbits, we just need a two foot high uh, exclusion fence. Could be chicken or netting. Uh, chicken wire is probably best. Netting, they may bite through depending on how hungry they are. And of course, birds usually comes with our summer vegetables. And then squirrels normally comes with my summer vegetables and, and we can touch on those later on. Uh, for new gardeners, I just wanted to put this slide in here. You, uh, I get asked about basic gardening tools. If you're looking just for, you know, what are the basics I need to have on hand to have a new garden? Uh, these are sort of, you know, get you a set of uh, a trowel, quality hand tools. That usually comes in threes if you go to the big box stores, uh, a garden spade or shovel, a garden fork, uh, some kind of uh, rake, uh, definitely have a trowel on hand. Um, soil knife and scissors. I definitely say like a dollar store scissors. Uh, I use a scissors for everything. I used, to, I used to go to the dollar store and just buy a handful of them and then just put them every place. They were located every place so I'd have something to cut stuff with. Um, I also have a soil knife. I love my soil knife. It's, it's useful for a number of things. And then gardening gloves. A lot of people, well, what do I need gloves for? I mean, you're dealing with the earth and you're dealing with a lot of amendments. And uh, from the voice of experience, uh, gloves can actually save your fingers and your hands. Um, it, I can't tell you the number of times that I've uh, cut myself or almost cut myself and my garden gloves saved me from uh, true catastrophes. The two times I was not wearing garden gloves in the, in the garden, um, we had a bit of a, an issue with uh, fingertips. And then of course a watering can. And then there's just some resources, uh, some books. I'll just leave up there while we take questions. Uh, some really great books if, if you have some time. <laughs> uh, most of you probably have some time now uh, to, read a, to read a book on gardening and these are some I recommend. All right, having said that, um, I think we're ready to, to take questions. Okay, I have a question. Do you have an opinion of raised bed soil mix from the big box stores? Um, depend, if, you're just, if you just have one raised bed, let's say you're doing a four by eight, just one raised bed, I would say um, you'd get half topsoil. Now, understand that the topsoil you're buying in the big box stores is 50% sand. And that's to make it so it's a little arable. So what you don't want to do is to buy sand as it, w along with the topsoil because the topsoil already contains the sand. Um, I would just find topsoil and I would find uh, 
um, compost, um, aged manure, and it would be a 50-50. So topsoil and then the other 50% should be either compost or aged manure or something like that. Now they are selling the big uh, bags of, they call it garden soil, but make sure it's appropriate for vegetables. And you could fill your raised bed uh, with those bags. Now, if you have a bigger raised bed, I recommend that you get with a local nursery, uh, call a local nursery and ask to have it delivered uh, because you're probably going to save money. Uh, but, it, you know, if that's not an option because you don't have any place to uh, dump it, um, just keep with the bag stuff, look for it to go on sale, make sure a 50-50 mix, topsoil and either compost or aged manure or other um, well composted matter, along with dry organic fertilizer. Okay, I don't seem to have any other questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions on particular uh, vegetables? Yes, we have a request to talk a little bit about asparagus. Asparagus. So um, last year I was doing a, a lecture, uh, I think it was down in Gum Spring. And uh, I, had, uh, I had somebody from the audience raise their hands and they said, uh, I just got my asparagus crowns in the mail and I'm going to plant them and I can't wait to harvest some of that asparagus this year. And um, unfortunately I had to break her heart um, because asparagus, you're probably gonna buy it online, you're gonna buy it as a crown um, and it needs to go into, into your uh, prepared bed. And we're talking production is gonna start maybe at, the, at year three um, we're going to lightly uh, harvest from it, and then year four is when we'll probably regularly harvest from it. So asparagus is one of those vegetables, we call it a perennial vegetable, because it will continue to come back year after year after year, um, unless it doesn't like where it's at. But it's going to take three years to actually establish. And we're doing the trench method of planting asparagus and I would go online and Google the specific uh, planting methods for asparagus because it is very important to have the bed prepared um, and well prepared um, and then uh, planted appropriately. But basically what you're doing is you're making an eight to 10 foot, eight to 12 foot trench and you're putting the crowns up a little bit. So they're raised up and then you're putting a little bit of soil over and as the crowns grow, into a plant, you're putting more and more soil on them until you reach um, the top of the bed. Uh, they have special uh, uh, fertilizer requirements. Um, and there's also requirements when we're trying to get them established as far as cutting them down. You know, they grow big, beautiful fronds on them uh, and they do attract uh, some pests. Uh, but uh, those fronds, we really don't wanna be cutting down until after the frost. Um, in the fall time. But establishing the beds, um, getting your crowns uh, from the online source, and then I would highly recommend that um, you Google getting an asparagus bed prepared properly. And then maintenance for the first, second year, and then we can start to enjoy them. So always in a space that uh, you want them for forever though. All right, I hope that, uh, Hope that helped you. Okay, thank you, Denise. I don't see any other questions. I did want to say, do you remember when we had asparagus at the demo garden? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> didn't really harvest much, did we? <laughs> no, no, we didn't. <laughs> but it was a beautiful plant. <laughs> you know, I was I was from Iowa. I'm from, well, I am from Iowa, not I was from Iowa. <laughs> I, I guess I still am from Iowa, but you know, we used to uh, harvest asparagus out of the road ditches. I mean, it, it just grew wild mm -hmm. and we harvested out of the road ditches and every family, of course, I, li I was lived on a farm in the country and every family had sort of laid claim to their space of asparagus in the road ditch. And so if we saw another family over there harvesting that stuff, boy, my dad, mom, they just go off. Like, you can't be here. This is ours. <laughs> this is 
it's our road ditch asparagus. And we get, they get some pretty hot and, and uh, heated arguments with some of those neighbors over who owned the asparagus in the road ditch. So those were, but we loved it. I, that's what I learned to appreciate asparagus. Yes, it's a great vegetable. So if we don't have any more questions, I would like to invite all of you to come back this time next week. So two o'clock next week, we'll send out new Zoom um, information on that will be on the Facebook page as well as Master Gardener homepage. Denise will be available for an hour long Q&A, open mic night, if you will, on uh, spring vegetables. So I don't see any more questions and I, I guess we will end the meeting now. So thank you very much to Denise Palmer for her thorough presentation on spring vegetables. All right, thank you. Thank Hope to see you next week. Yes. <laughs>